thank you. I, I was telling someone last night that uh, it was my like sort of task of the quarter, uh, maybe five or six years ago, to fix maintenance scaling and make it work for large repos. Uh, and I'm on track to be only like 25 or 30 quarters behind schedule uh, of actually getting that done. So l let's talk a little bit about what that is. Uh, here we go. So scaling Git. Uh, as Scott mentioned, my name's Taylor. I'm a staff software engineer at GitHub. Uh, this sort of thing is my primary focus. I care more than I'm willing to admit about repository performance, its ability to, uh, to grow and to take on the newest and sort of most complex repos uh, that we can't even really fathom today. So an agenda of sort of what we're gonna go over to you, uh, there's a lot of content here. We don't have a ton of time to get through it, so this is gonna be sort of a whirlwind tour of the last four or five years of my life. Uh, if you've got questions, there's gonna be a couple of spots I'll refer you to other presentations I've given. And if you've got even more questions, uh, you can find me in the hallway or between talks, uh, and I'll be happy to talk your ear off about it. Okay, so we're gonna get started with sort of an overview of what GitHub's repository maintenance routines looked like, let's say prior to 2020. And then we're gonna talk about, which is sort of a brief recap of the talk I gave a couple of years ago at Git Merge uh, in Chicago, about some new techniques we developed to sort of, in many cases, make that operation much faster and tractable for smaller uh, uh, running times, even with large repos. And we're gonna spend the bulk of our talk today talking about new things, uh, some stuff that I've been working on with others in this room for about the past year and a half or so. Um, we're gonna talk about multi-pack verbatim reuse, boundary-based bitmap traversals, pseudo-merge reachability bitmaps, multi-cruff packs, and incremental mitixes. And if absolutely none of those words uh, meant anything to you, uh, hopefully, uh, it'll be the case that, that that won't be true towards the end of the talk. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first, we'll, we're gonna talk about legacy repository maintenance. So some background here is every time you push uh, you know, some pack up to a new repository on GitHub, we land the contents of your pack as a pack file within that repo. And every 20 or so pushes, or by the time the repository gets to 20 or so packs, we'll run this maintenance job in the background. And there's a lot of layers of plumbing and orchestration that kind of goes into it, um, but effectively, we're, we're just repacking the repository down into a single pack and updating bitmaps. So why might you want to do this? Uh, the answer, the most obvious answer anyway, is that it enables you to perform object lookups much faster. Of course, objects, when they're all stored together in a single pack, you can find any individual one in logarithmic time proportional to the size of the pack. But it can be linear if you have a lot of packs and they're all spread out, and that's sort of the worst case scenario. Uh, another important reason why we do this is that it keeps the reachability bitmaps up to date. Again, if you don't know anything about reachability bitmaps, hopefully that won't be the case by the end of the talk, but this is a key optimization for uh, GitHub and many sites like us to be able to efficiently serve fetches and clones uh, to the user. It does other things too, like it compacts loose objects and references and enables our sort of verbatim pack reuse optimization, which we'll also talk quite a lot about here. And so you can imagine uh, that though this solution served GitHub well for many years, uh, that we started to notice some problems uh, when running it, especially around 2019 or so. Um, one of those big problems is that it generates a single pack for all of the objects in a repository. And that can be a really slow operation or particularly memory intensive, especially in large repositories where generating these things just takes an inordinate amount of time. Uh, it often ran us into these sort of self-imposed timeouts, which would degrade the repository's performance, thus making it harder to run maintenance and subsequent inv invocations, and you'd end up in this sort of vicious feedback loop of almost never being able to get the repository back into a maintainable state. And like I mentioned, if you fail to do this thing frequently enough, even the users will start to notice that the repository isn't performing as quickly as it once was, and so then things get kind of dicey. So I'm gonna talk now just for a few minutes about uh, some tools that my colleagues and I developed a number of years ago to alleviate a lot of these problems uh, and improve our repository maintenance strategy on GitHub. So these are gonna be geometric repacking, multi-pack bitmaps. And again, I've given a talk a couple of years ago at Git Merge that went into both of these in great detail, and so I'd encourage you, if you've got more questions, uh, those are a good place to, to refer back to. Let's start with geometric repacking. The idea with geometric repacking is, is fairly simple, and it's instead of packing your repository down into just a single pack, you wanna ensure that you have some property across multiple packs that form a sequence, say like each pack contains at least twice as many objects as the next, next largest pack. And this is really appealing property because it's fairly simple to describe and it's fairly simple to describe in code, but it has the effect of maintenance generally only kind of running on the more recent history and avoiding expensive recaps, uh, repacks. The only time your repository would do a sort of all into one or expensive repack is if the repository doubled in size between now and the last maintenance run. So here's a little cartoon I drew of kind of what that looks like. I have a pack structure here. I think there are seven packs. 
Uh, and the, the number inside of those packs indicates how many objects are contained in each pack. And so you can see for everything that I've drawn to the right of that red dotted line, all the packs that I colored in green, those maintain that property. Four has at least twice as many objects as one, 32 at least twice as four, and so on. But if you'll notice to the left of that dashed line, both of those packs violate the, the, the sort of scaling invariant on the geometric pack sequence. And so Git knows that it would be, uh, it, that it at least is going to need to combine those two packs together to in order to uh, restore the progression. And if you're looking carefully, you might notice that actually doing just that would be good enough. You'd likely produce a pack that contains two objects. You could slot that into the packs between one and four, and that would actually give you back your geometric progression. But Git's not quite that smart. Of course, this is equivalent to the bin packing problem, and so can be NP hard. And so what Git does is it says, okay, I know I'm gonna at least need to repack these two ones that I've colored in red, and I'll just start taking more packs that I didn't think I was gonna have to repack until I get a pack whose size is uh, sufficient to restore the progression. So in that case, it looks like selecting the first four packs. When I combine those all together, I get a pack with seven objects, and I've restored the progression. Next, let's talk about reachability bitmaps. Reachability bitmaps are still an extremely critical optimization. These are sort of a side index that allow us to say for some selection or subset of commits within your repository, they provide you a bit string which indicates exactly the set of objects reachable from that commit. So you can do lots of things like figure out the set of objects to send during a clone by oring together a bunch of bitmaps or computing the set of objects sent for a fetch by doing the same thing and then negating out some of the bitmaps for objects that you don't want and so on. But the question is which pack do we use to generate the bitmap when we're in the sort of geometric repacking world? Of course, single pack bitmaps only know how to refer to objects in one pack, and so you can't generate bitmaps for new parts of the repository based on an older pack and vice versa. So the idea we had is sort of easy to explain and uh, anything but to implement. Uh, but the idea was to sort of imagine that there's a pack that looks like the sort of concatenation of all of these little sub-packs inside the multi-pack index, and to impose some order on that pack to make it act as if it's, uh, to, basically to make it sufficient for bitmapping. Again, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here because I've covered this a lot in, in my past talks, uh, but here you can see I've drawn another little cartoon. There are three packs at the bottom. They have some objects indicated by the different colored rectangles. And then the multi-pack index knows about for each of those objects in what pack they appear and where in that pack they're located. And then that sort of mess of dotted intertwining arrows up top, that's the permutation on the order of objects in the multi-pack index into this concatenated pseudo-pack order. And so the idea is, is if you can simulate but not actually ever generate a pack that looks like that, that would be sufficient uh, to generate bitmaps. So that kind of brings us to GitHub's current maintenance approach, more or less what's running today. Uh, and it's a two-tiered repository maintenance approach. We do N, where N is something like 32, fast maintenance routines, which are just doing a geometric repacking and updating the multi-pack indices along with a few other uh, kind of bookkeeping parts. And then we do one slow maintenance operation, which basically looks like the sort of pre-2020 version of maintenance, where we compact all the repository's objects down together, start over with a single pack, destroying the progression. And like I've said, I'm skipping over some details here, like single pack uh, and multi-pack reverse indexes, cruff packs, and so forth. Um, again, for more details, my previous talk has a lot of them. Uh, and, and this has been working more or less pretty well uh, for us at GitHub, but it's not without its own problems. Of course, the fast tier maintenance operations still need to update bitmaps and midices, which is inherently an operation that scales linearly in the size of the repository, even when you're doing just a fast update. And not to mention the slow tier maintenance operations being just the same as they were, you know, more than four years ago, they're just as slow as they always were, and so they're likely gonna be intractable for us to compute in any reasonable amount of time for repositories that are sort of inordinately large. And so the question that I've been sort of obsessed with over the past year or so is, what would it take to just do only the fast operations on a repository? There's a lot of consideration you have to take. You, there are gonna be missed delta opportunities between packs unless they're stored thin. You can't do verbatim pack reuse across multiple packs, and et cetera. So for the remaining section of the talk today, I'm gonna to talk about four or five new tools that I believe are gonna eliminate these, uh, the sort of things that you would otherwise have to give up so that we can land in a world where you can really only do cheap maintenance operations on your repository with absolutely uncompromising performance. So what are those new things? First one we're gonna talk about today is multi-pack reuse, the uh, ability for Git to extend its verbatim pack reuse mechanism to cover multiple packs, enabling us to store multiple packs at rest. We're gonna talk about some bitmap improvements, like faster traversal and reads for repositories that have a lot of references or poor bitmap coverage. 
we're going to talk about multi cruft pack support, the ability for Git to quickly add sets of objects to the unreachable class, uh, independent of how large that class is, up to just some sort of fixed bound. And finally, we're going to talk about an area that I'm most excited about, which is truly incremental multi pack index bitmap updates. These are going to be fast updates that take linear time proportional solely to just the new objects in your repository, never scaling with the whole repository. Let's start with multi pack reuse. So we know that when Git wants to generate a pack, let's say to fulfill some fetch or clone request, Git will either write an object based on some existing copy, or it might write a delta based on some existing information about a base that that object is stored against. Or, in the section we'll talk a lot about here, is it, write, it might write a section verbatim from an existing pack. And when can it do this? Well, verbatim reuse occurs when the request has some section that looks an awful lot similar to some existing section in a source pack. And when Git can identify this, It'll sort of, you can imagine it just sort of takes that section in the source pack and plops it, plops it into the destination pack. Uh, and doing so ends up being, uh, can often be, excuse me, a significant speed up because you don't need to have any bookkeeping uh, or, or uh, entries in your packing data array for any of those individual objects if you can copy a large region at once. So when this is the case, Git will try to stream those bytes directly from a source pack in order to fulfill a fetch or clone request. And like I said, it avoids per object bookkeeping and so it's generally much faster. But verbatim reuse only supported pack reuse from a single source pack, never multiple. And so uh, towards the end of last year, I, I thought about uh, trying to make it so that we could use this verbatim pack reuse uh, mechanism over multiple packs in certain circumstances. And I've drawn here a little cartoon to explain uh, sort of at a very high level of how that works. So here I have a bitmap up at the top that describes which objects should and shouldn't appear uh, in the resulting pack. I have four packs that contain four, five, and three objects respectively. You can see some of them don't end up ever getting colored red or green. That's because they're duplicates and so they have no corresponding entry in the bitmap. And then the pack at the bottom indicated with the uh, sort of thicker green highlights, that corresponds to the sections that we were able to reuse from our packs in assembling the final pack. So to explain what's going on here, the first pack is really straightforward. All of the four bits corresponding to objects in that pack are set to ones. That means the caller wants everything in that pack and so that's a totally isolated case. We can just take that whole pack and dump it out into the final pack. The second pack, things get a little bit more interesting. You can see we want object 04, and even though we do want object 07, it's stored as a delta of 05, indicated by the little squiggly arrow underneath it, but of course 05 isn't wanted in the final pack, and so in this case, we actually can't send 07, and we have to kick it back to the slow path. Uh, now, now, I should mention, independent of this slide, uh, this past week I've been working on a way to lift that requirement which I think will make this multi-pack reuse optimization even faster uh, when we can send 07 as long as we know that the caller already has 05. Uh, but a little bit out of scope for this talk so hopefully I'll have more to say soon about that on the list. Uh, the last object in that second pack of course is, is trivial. We don't want it and we don't send it. Finally, the last pack wants to send objects 9 and 10. 10 is stored as a delta of 9 but there's some object that we didn't send in the middle of those and so we need to patch any sort of offset uh, delta values from 10 to 9 uh, to account for the difference in size uh, between those two in the resulting pack. So to recap, we can copy bytes verbatim from a given object to a source pack if the destination pack should include that object, the source object is either a delta of an object we reused earlier or isn't stored as a delta, and we need to break cross-pack deltas. We also need to patch any offset delta values when there's at least one non-reused byte between the delta and base objects. So now that we've got this working, the question is, is it any faster? And here I am simulating a clone of the Git repository with and without multi-pack reuse. You can see with single-pack reuse, it took about six seconds. With multi-pack reuse, it took just under, uh, just over, excuse me, 900 milliseconds for about a 6.7x speed up. So we were really happy about that. Uh, just a brief detour, uh, while uh, something interesting I noticed while we were rolling this out a couple of weeks ago uh, is the non-collision detecting uh, SHA-1 idea that I've been kicking around for a while. So many of you in this room may know that Git uses a collision detecting implementation of SHA-1 that's resistant to attacks like shattered and shambles. But I noticed something really interesting when we were starting to use multi-pack reuse within GitHub's infrastructure. This is a cache grind output of a Linux clone that I sampled off of one of our servers. And I've highlighted here, although it's a little bit small, uh, we're spending 78% of our CPU instructions to compute a clone, just checksumming the contents of that clone. And so that's kind of astounding to me. And, and I think it's clear what's happening is that we're paying some performance penalty for additional guarantees within the collision detecting SHA-1 implementation. 
But what's interesting is that we're using that value not for a cryptographic purpose. We really just care about it as a data integrity checksum. And so the question was, could you use a faster, let's say non-collision detecting SHA-1 implementation that trades cryptographic, cryptographic security for speed? And the answer is yes. Uh, there is a lot of subtlety uh, in corner cases, and I think uh, the whole list thought about it very carefully, but uh, the answer I think ultimately is that yes, this is a safe thing to do. And uh, as always, now that we've got it working, the question is, how much faster is it? So here I'm cloning uh, the Linux repository uh, to try to see how much faster it is with and without the SHA-1 implementation. With the slow SHA-1, it takes about 17 seconds on my machine. With the fast SHA-1, it takes only 10. And so that's about a 1.7x speed up, which we're also really happy about. Next, I want to talk about a couple of bitmap improvements. So bitmaps, as I mentioned earlier, is the sort of side index that says, for some selection of commits, here's a bit string corresponding to it that tells you which objects are reachable from that commit. Ideally, you'd have a bitmap for every branch and tag in your repository, and every object query would just look like, grab the right bitmaps, combine them together in the right way, and get your answer. But of course, having a bitmap for each reference can be really expensive. And so why is that? Well, they require a lot of memory. They can be very cache inefficient. We can spend a lot of time just EWOD decompressing them or XORing them together and so forth. And so as sort of a middle ground, I worked on two improvements to bitmap reads uh, that I'm going to talk about today. One is boundary-based bitmap traversal, and the other is pseudo-merge reachability bitmaps. Let's start with the former. The existing bitmap routine sort of pre-boundary-based traversal is to build up a complete copy of the set of objects you don't want, store that in a bitmap, and then to do the same thing for the objects that you do want, reusing bitmaps when you can, stopping when you run into an object you've already seen or know that you don't want, or et cetera. Finally, when you have a good enough copy on both sides, you can take the and not of them, and that's the set of objects to send. Here's a little demo of what that looks like. Here I'm trying to find the objects just on main, but not on any of the other branches like foo, bar, baz, and fux. You can see I take each of the reps that I don't want, starting with foo, moving to bar, up to baz, and so on, and I walk backwards throughout history until I either see a bitmap, like I do at 242, or bar, and then I can fill in the bits corresponding to that bitmap, doing any fill-in traversal as necessary. Finally, once that's done, I can start on the side of the query for the objects that I do want, perform a similar walk, stopping when I run into bits that I've already seen and know I don't want, and then really quickly determine that, oh, C6 and C7 are the objects that I want here. So with poor bitmap coverage, of course, that existing tra traversal can actually degenerate into something that's a little bit worse than a full object walk. Uh, a little bit worse, of course, because there's some bookkeeping overhead inherent to that operation uh, that doesn't exist in regular full object walks. And so an idea that Pef and I, who, who's in the audience today, had uh, sort of an embarrassingly number of years ago uh, was to represent the uninteresting side of the career, the things that you don't want to send, by just the boundary between the interesting and uninteresting objects. And so for our purposes, the exact technical definition of boundary isn't gonna be super important, but you can just think of it as, as the sort of frontier between the things that you do and don't want. So here's a little demo of that same query. You can see we start by marking object C5 as the boundary. It's the first thing that's reachable from main, but that is also reachable from some uh, uh, part of the query that we don't want. And so all we have to do is walk from C5 back to the nearest bitmap, then walk from main into C5, and we're done. And so if you have, a, say, a repository with a lot of spiky branches with really poor bitmap coverage, instead of having to walk down from each of those branches to the nearest bitmap, you can find a good sort of approximate starting location and walk down from there. Again, now that we got this working, how much faster is it? Uh, and here's the answer. To count the unique number of objects on whatever my working branch was in git git, the existing traversal took about 83 milliseconds. The new tra traversal takes just under 20 milliseconds. That's about a 4.2 speed up. Next, I'm gonna talk about pseudo-merges. Pseudo-merges uh, contribute to sort of another aspect of poor bitmap coverage when there are a lot of references that limit the sort of heuristics we use to select bitmaps. So an example that I find useful to think about here is suppose a user tells you they already have objects corresponding to branches A, B, and C, and they don't want you to send any objects reachable from all three of those branches. Ideally, you would have bitmaps for all of those branches. You could or them together, and that would be what you decide not to send on the uninteresting side. But like we've mentioned, storing bitmaps for individual branches can be expensive, and so the question we asked ourselves was, what if you could actually store just a single bitmap corresponding to the conceptual merge between A, B, and C? Of course, you wouldn't be able to use that bitmap if you just wanted information about one of its three parents, but if you know that the caller wants or doesn't want all three of those objects, it's just as good. So here's a little demo of that. 
You can see I've marked some bitmaps in the lower left corner. The one with many parents, that topmost one, is a pseudo merge between the commits listed there. You can see with just a little bit of walking at the beginning of my traversal, I can pretty quickly determine that I've satisfied the, the prerequisites to use that pseudo merge bitmap. And then I can really quickly OR in all of those bits, significantly limiting the amount of traversal I have to do. And so here again, this is on GitHub's internal mono repo. How much faster is it to use pseudo merges versus not? Here's the answer. Uh, it takes 16.13 seconds about to count all the objects in GitHub's mono repo with bitmaps but with no pseudo merges. And if you add pseudo merges into the mix, it goes to about 875 milliseconds for an 18 and a half X uh, factor speed up. So we're really excited about that too. A uh, couple more topics here, just very briefly. We're going to talk about multiple cruft pack support. So cruft packs are a technique I developed a few years ago uh, in collaboration with Pep, who's also in the audience, to have a side index for unreachable objects indicating when they were last modified. Uh, and the idea is you use this information to know when to keep around and when to expire unreachable objects if you have some sort of cutoff window. Uh, it requires a significant number of I.O. cycles to update this set because we never insert a record into the middle of a file. We're always rewriting the entire cruft pack. Um, and so the solution that we came up with, and I, I don't really have a, a cute demo to show you, um, but at least the solution and concept that I'll share with you, which is upstream, uh, is that you can store multiple cruft packs and break ties in favor of the most recently modified time for some object. And this works really well because you can also specify, say, I want my cruft packs to never grow beyond three gigs. And what Git will do is it will continuously rewrite any small cruft packs until they reach that three gigabyte threshold. Then they'll mark them as frozen and we'll never rewrite those cruft packs again. So it's a nice way to bound the size uh, or the amount of time that you spend updating cruft packs. Next, I just briefly want to talk about incremental midexes and bitmaps. And to sort of recap, we've talked about a lot of optimizations so far. But updating the midex and by extension its bitmaps still scales with the whole size of the repository. We really want to get to a place where bitmaps can be updated independently of pack generation and that updating those bitmaps doesn't actually require rewriting any existing bitmaps. So in other words, my dream is to have bitmap updates that take time truly proportional just to the number of new objects in your repository. So how do we get there? The idea is to store the multipack index as a multi-layered chain where each chain contains a distinct set of objects uh, and packs from any previous chain. The object order for that concatenated chain is just the individual object orders within each layer of the midex strung together in order of the um, way the layers appear in the chain file. That's safe to do, uh, a lot of technical reasons in order to justify that, but I think for our purposes it's good enough to assume that it's okay. And I'll say that this is still in development, so I don't have a ton to share here yet, but I will share a little bit of my approach, which is that we're doing this in a few phases. Phase one, which is already complete, is support for incremental midexes without bitmaps. Phase two will bring bitmap support to that implementation. Phase three will deliver a new repacking strategy. And phase one is merged, phase two is in review, and phase three is still in design. Putting it all together, the pre-2020 maintenance routines we had scaled as a linear function of the total repository size. Our current maintenance routines mostly scale according to the number of new objects in our repository, but still have really expensive maintenance steps at the end of long cycles. And today we talked about four groups of work that I think will obviate that need. We talked about multi-pack reuse, the ability to break repositories into multiple packs long-term without any sacrifices on performance. We talked about multi cruft pack support, the ability to cheaply update the set of unreachable objects regardless of size. Some bitmap improvements like fast repository traversal even with large numbers of references. And incremental midex bitmaps, what I think will be sort of the glue to bring all this together, which is cheap ways to update the set of reachability bitmaps when working only in recent parts of the history. So if I can leave you with just a few things, I believe that Git repository maintenance can scale to the world's largest repositories and beyond to repos that we haven't even conceived of yet. I believe that that maintenance is going to be powered by tools and techniques that we developed at GitHub, many of which were discussed today and shared with the open source project. And that those same tools powering GitHub's ability to run maintenance on large mono repos can and do run on your laptops all the time, which I think is pretty cool. Thank you.